Now, I've covered all manner of horrors on this show. Things that would, in some cases, literally make your skin crawl. But this is the first time I've ever felt the need to start off the video with a disclaimer. So be warned, if you are a student in college or university or any type of institution, whether it be Bardic or otherwise, and you've got finals coming up, this monster is one that you will definitely want to avoid. Because while this thing's true name is the Moigno, what it is often referred to as is the Living Equation. So for those of you who are brave enough to continue watching, welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D and bring them to light and use them for 5th edition D&D, complete with a stat block and everything. Speaking of which, if you would like to see the stat block while we're going through the video, or at the end of the video you decide you just want to use this monster, that stat block can be found in the description directly below. But to get back on topic, the living equation is literally a thought. Not that kind of thought, but the type of thought that is so advanced and so complex in its machinations that it literally gained sentience independent of the one who first conceived of it. That means the thought's thinking about stuff. I'm sure you've got some questions like, where does it come from and why does it have such a stupid name? And the answer to both of those questions is that it was created by a wizard named Moigno. So I guess we just named it after him. Anyways, as the story goes, this wizard was experimenting with thought magic, whatever that means, and had some kind of idea that ended up being so complex when he tried to put it into practice. Of course, there was a magical mishap and he was destroyed. But what wasn't destroyed was his idea. It literally gained sentience and became a new creature all in and of itself. And I think that's a really cool concept for a monster and it's also a really difficult concept to describe in terms of what that would even look like. So there's very little art of this creature that exists and what we do have essentially depicts it as a circular dial filled with equations and numbers and all that kind of stuff, which I think is probably the best representation we're going to get, just essentially a 2D floating mass of numbers and equations that are constantly changing and shifting. But with all that said, today we are going to talk about just exactly what this thing can do in combat, and then of course some ways that you can apply it in your game. But first things first, in order to understand and use this creature, we need to understand exactly what its abilities are, and by extension how it can use those abilities in combat. So let's take a look at some. So the first thing we need to know about this creature is it is immune to any type of physical combat. Piercing, slashing, bludgeoning, not happening. And it resists pretty much every other type of damage. The only type of damage it does not have resistance to is force damage and psychic damage. And as a matter of fact, it is vulnerable to psychic damage because it literally is a disruption of what this creature is trying to do. You're talking about a being that is created by psychic energy, so of course psychic damage is going to disrupt that. And speaking of psychic energy, this thing is pretty low on the linguistic skills level, considering it does not have a mouth, so one of the most obvious things that a player might try to do is create a telepathic bond with this creature. That is totally possible, and if you have a player in your game that uses telepathy, it will work as long as they can pass an intelligence save. See, forming a connection with a creature like this telepathically is pretty dangerous for the other being in question. So if you fail that intelligence save, your mind is just overloaded with way too much information simultaneously. The connection fails, so if it was a spell, the spell is wasted, and if it was a class ability, like what some warlocks have access to, then it just simply doesn't work. And you're also stunned for a few rounds, which, outside of combat, not the end of the world, in combat, could be the end of the world. Also, this thing obviously doesn't have legs. It hovers around pretty quickly. Uh, it has a move speed of 40 feet. However, it can forego that move speed to simply blink, disappear and reappear in another area within 30 feet. So it sacrifices a little bit of distance for a ton of mobility. Now, I don't usually get into specific stats when I'm talking about my monsters because you have the stat block. If you want to take a look at it, it's all right there in black and white, but this monster's stats actually have a huge impact on what this creature actually is capable of. Specifically, its intelligence score is just ridiculous. It is a 28 in intelligence, which gives it a modifier of plus 9. That's pretty steep. That said, its wisdom isn't awesome. This creature is literally the definition of being book smart, but not street smart. But that said, the way you use this creature in combat should reflect that. It is extremely intelligent. 
so it's not going to fall into any obvious ploys or go for any easy tricks. Its intelligence is literally its biggest defense, and of course it's going to want to avoid combat, but if it does come down to it, it has one option at its disposal. Because most living things are essentially just really complex biological computers, this creature has devised a way to mess with that. It has to be five feet away from a creature, and then it literally reaches out and touches that creature and tries to invade its body with a portion of its code. The creature has to make an intelligence save to resist this, but either way, it is going to take some psychic damage. The save just determines whether it takes full psychic damage or half psychic damage. Because what the Moingo is literally doing is messing with the creature's nervous system, redirecting things, causing paradoxes, that sort of thing and it can do that to a biological machine just as easily as an actual machine. But if this creature has one thing going for it aside from its fast intelligence, it's also the fact that they're usually found in pretty great numbers. All Moignos consider themselves part of the same collective. So, when they're encountered in a large group, something really interesting can happen. Once this thing has been damaged in any way, it's able to use its reaction to essentially latch onto another Moigno and merge with it. The Moigno who is being targeted by this ability, which is called Consolidate, gains a number of temporary hit points equal to the hit points that were still remaining of the Moigno that originally latched onto it. And in the stat block there you'll also see there's a table, so every time two of these things come together, they gain extra hit points and their main means of attack does a little bit of extra damage. They also increase in size, of course, because there's literally more mass coming together. This can be really useful and also really dangerous, depending on the situation. Which brings me on to my next subject. Let's talk about what some of those situations might be and take a look at a few. So one big question that you kind of have to answer for every monster, which is more easily answered for some than others, is where does this creature fit into the cosmology? In the grand scale of the universe and all the people and things and creatures and everything that's going on, what role do these creatures fill and where can they be found? As a dungeon master, that's for you to ultimately decide. However, if we go by the lore of this creature, which is originally from Planescape, it should come as no surprise that these creatures are found on the plane of Mechanus. For those of you who are not informed, that is the plane of absolute law. It is ruled over by Primus and his legions of Modrons, which are those tiny little things that the minions ripped off. So when the first living equation made its way to Mechanus, which I imagine is a place it was naturally drawn to considering the nature of its being, the Modrons saw it immediately as an ally, a being literally made of rational thought. It should fit right in on the plane of law, and it did almost a little too well. See, what ended up happening is the Moigno started replicating itself, which is literally just when it builds itself, builds itself, builds itself with all these different equations. Eventually it splits off, and then there are two of them, and then they build up, build up, build up, and split off again. You can kind of see where this is going. What ended up happening is the Moigno started propagating themselves uncontrollably, and started reshaping the plane to kind of suit them in the way they thought that it should be run, which is obviously not completely the same way that the Modrons were running things. So the Modrons kind of went into panic mode and their ridiculous sci-fi premise solution to this problem was to introduce the Moignos to the concept of the irrational number pi. That's right, 3.14, etc., etc. They told them about this number and explained the equation to them, and the Moignos then became obsessed with solving this problem, as is their nature. The only thing is, there is no absolute value to pi, at least not that we've been able to figure out in the real world as humans, because it just goes on forever. So the living equations became absolutely obsessed with trying to find the whole number of pi, and that's what they are continuing to do to this day. Every single one of them devotes all of their time and energy to mapping the sequences of pi, and it's kind of a collective effort that they all work on together. And that essentially gave them purpose and a mission, and then they were able to assist the Modrons just kind of on the side. So the Modrons now use them as essentially extremely advanced calculators that are capable of mapping things on a literally planar scale, and they will begrudgingly do so, not because they hate the Modrons or they dislike what they're trying to get them to do, but just because anytime they're helping the Modrons with whatever busy work they need help with, they are being distracted from trying to find the value of pi. Now this of course raises some interesting questions. The first of which, 
what happens if they actually do find the value of pi? I mean, as far as we know, it's infinite, but you're talking about tens of thousands of beings that are vastly more capable than any supercomputer that exists in the real world that have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. So who knows? Maybe they'll figure it out. And if they do, maybe they'll, again, wreak havoc on the plane of mechanics, not by killing or destroying anything, but just by reshaping it kind of the way they want it to be shaped, which for a two-dimensional sequence of algorithms and thoughts might not be great for those of us that live in the 3D material world. But who knows? That could be the plot of an entire campaign. The Moignos solve Pi. They're going rampant you have to go and try to stop them. They can also be used to great effect as a boss encounter. If you have a whole bunch of them and then they all start merging together and forming and forming, latching onto this one signal Moigno that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and obviously more dangerous and obviously much more HP-ish, it's gonna be a really interesting fight for sure because your players will be trying to kill these things in one hit before they can damage them and then have them latch onto the main enemy. Or you could use them just as kind of a support character for an NPC. This is literally just their hyper-intelligent computer-ish ally that they can ask questions to and knows a lot about the world because it's been around for a long time and it is also extremely intelligent. So if it doesn't know a specific piece of information, it will absolutely be able to figure out how you would get that information. These creatures aren't out adventuring, so they haven't necessarily seen a lot of the world, so maybe they don't know a lot about history, but they're extremely efficient when it comes to solving problems, at least mentally anyways. So there's a lot of ways that that could help you out as long as you're able to ask it the right questions. In any case, that is the Moigno, the living equation. So hopefully you found this video useful and helpful. And if you like these guys and you want to use them, like I said, the stat blocks in the description below. And of course, if you are one of my awesome patrons, the monster manual style stat block can be found on my Patreon page. If you are not one of my patrons, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's three bucks a month, you get at least four fancy stat blocks every month, and you also get to kind of see what I'm working on and what I'm doing it. So you get previews of Monster of the Week, and right now I'm also trying to make a new subclass for every one of the existing classes, which will ultimately turn into a supplement that will go up in the DMs Guild or something like that. But if you don't have any extra cash kicking around and you do want to support the channel, subscribing is the easiest and freest way to do that, and honestly, I appreciate it a ton. But at the end of the day, I just want to say thank you so much for watching and thank you for showing up and being here and let me know if there's any monsters you'd like to see in the future covered on this channel, either in the comments or Discord or Twitter or whatever. I will add them to the list and they will most likely show up here someday. That list keeps growing by the second. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Until then.